And hey everyone, welcome once again to Intro to the UM. This is really the first full lecture of the semester and one that uh, continues to introduce us to the function and the day-to-day -day workings of the United Nations, but takes it a little bit deeper, right? Takes a look at what the UN has accomplished over the past 75 years, um, what it still needs to address, what elements of reform might be necessary, and what areas of the UN might be the most lucrative for people who want to get involved in this organization to, you know, make a change in the world, right? And if we remember the readings that we had, and this is particularly the one by Roland Rich, um, there are not, there's not one UN, but really three, right? Three layers of UN interaction, cooperation, and communication. So this kind of continues the introduction that we had in the first lecture, um, but also sets us up for placing the UN as the preeminent um, international organization of global governance um, moving forward within the rest of the 21st century. And yes, um, you know, knowing if you did the math here, we are effectively celebrating the 75th anniversary of this organization. And some people are kind of surprised that it's lasted you know, as long as it has. Um, but as I said in the introduction, the UN has a number of vices, but I think those vices are overshadowed and outnumbered by a number of potential virtues. So in continuing what we were talking about in the introductory lecture, um, the United Nations in global context is still the only international intergovernmental organization of some you know, global scope and near universal membership with an all-encompassing socioeconomic agenda. So while I will once again repeat that the United Nations is not, and by all accounts will not be on track to become a world government, um, anytime soon, I mean, certainly not in my lifetime and, you know, most likely not in yours. It is the one IGO out there that has the entire planet um, within its area of interest and concern. And the history of the UN from, you know, the late, uh, you know, 1945, early 1946, um, you know, has seen this organization promote really, if anything, um, a global culture, right? A sense of global interconnectedness and interdependency. And I think that this is mostly predicated around a culture of legality and rule of law, which if you know anything about international relations theory, right, you know that the concept of international law is at the absolute best um, you know, just that, a concept, right? It's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way of thinking rather than something that is empirically defined, right? The, the, the most tangible elements of law still reside in states, all 193 of them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that international law is nothing more than a figment of one's imagination. The United Nations, more than anything else, is there to, if not codify um, international legality and a rule of law, it's there to keep our minds focused that these things do exist and that it is necessary for us to consider, um, at the absolute least, just simply for you know, a number of states to cooperate, uh, to work together towards achieving some kind of greater common good. And so within that, right, the United Nations has done a number of other, um, you know, major accomplishments. It has raised awareness for the plight of the world's poor. It has promoted some genuine concern for human rights, which within that includes the status of women, the rights of children, and the needs of indigenous people. It has served as an inspiration, as well as a focal point for peacekeeping and conflict resolution, especially within the latter part, conflict resolution, um, 
you know, the idea that a protracted conflict, either within one state or between two or more, um, if it gets, let's say, you know, a UN uh, delegation to oversee the early elements of peace and disarmament and some kind of a post-conflict arrangement, well, then you know that you're in good hands, or at the absolute least, like, you're, you, you know, you're being uh, managed by some, you know, legitimate international institutional uh, concern. Uh, the United Nations has also been a major advocate for multilateral diplomacy, and this, I think, is going to really come into play in the weeks and months ahead, now that um, the United States is looking to re-engage the world and reestablish uh, close partnerships and cooperations with many countries and allies around the world that, you know, Biden and his team have felt Trump just destroyed. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the United States is going to become a world hegemon anymore. In fact, as I'm recording this lecture, um, I read earlier this morning uh, Biden's speech at the uh, State Department, which seems surprisingly, as far as I'm concerned, um, r not so much conciliatory towards multilateralism and an acknowledgement of multipolarism around the world, but it seems like he is willing to have the United States work as a key component with a number of other countries and organizations in promoting this sense of moral good, right? A sense of um, you know moral global imperatives like you know world hunger. Um, energy crises, the environment, the rule of law, and other elements like that, including, right, human sustainability. The United Nations, alongside that, right, has been a key partner. In fact, I would even go so far as to say like a coordinator with a number of non-governmental organizations. And if you remember from the first lecture, we talked about how, you know, the UN is very good at raising awareness for things, but in actually implementing the things necessary to make things better, that's the involvement of smaller, more surgically oriented NGOs. The fact that the UN works with that gives us the, you know, understanding that human development in some small part of the world is still being monitored, right? Still being somehow man managed uh, by this large international organization. And I think with all of that, probably the most um, subjective, the most uh, normative element um, about the UN's global context is that despite its um, problems, despite its shortcomings, its internal corruption, its um, institutional mismanagement that you know, people just know about, the United Nations retains a brand image, right? A brand image of positive global cooperation and engagement. In so many words, the United Nations still has a significant degree of street credit, right? Le public legitimacy. People look to the UN, um, for better or for worse, right? As the moral guide for promoting and expanding um, human development and sustainability. So the United Nations has, I think, a rather good track record, you know, 75 years after um, its founding. Um, and what's also important to note is that while we might look at the structure of the UN and oftentimes think, you know, it still has a lot of symbolic retention of the Cold War, you know, especially when we think of the five permanent members of the Security Council that are representative of the allied, victor you know, the victorious allies of the Second World War, um, we kind of lose sight of the fact that the UN has developed, right? It has evolved over the years. Um, not enough to, you know, warrant, uh, you know, a major article about it, but, you know, those that have studied the UN have kind of noted that, you know, at least within three or four general phases, right? We've seen the early United Nations go from an organization clearly controlled and I would even say dominated uh, by two major countries, the United States and the Soviet Union. So I would say like within the first, let's say 10 years or so, right? The UN was kind of the place where both uh, Washington and Moscow engaged in multiple bouts of diplomatic tug of war. And you know, it's not surprising that this happens when we think about, you know, the late 40s, 
early to mid-1950s. UN membership is still relatively small. Colonies are still, for the most part, a thing. Um, France and Great Britain are still kind of playing sidekick to the United States as an emerging global superpower. And that superpower is, of course, balanced, counterbalanced uh, by the Soviet Union. So, you know, the early stages of the Cold War um, are seen not just in the diplomatic cables between Washington and Moscow, but they're seen between the competing UN delegates, um, if not in the General Assembly, definitely, for sure, uh, within the Security Council, where anything that the United States brings up will be you know, opposed and ultimately vetoed by the Soviet Union, and you know, vice versa. The Soviet Union brings something up, and the United States will oppose and veto it. But even here, Right, even here, even the rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, we can, you know, take a look at the United Nations in being some kind of third-way intermediary that brings these two nuclear powers to some kind of modus vivendi by the 1950s, um, particularly when. Right. It is painfully known that both of these countries, along with a number of others, possess nuclear capability. Right. Nuclear capability that could wipe out the global population. Now, this is still a major threat, ladies and gentlemen, you know, here in 2021. I mean, don't get me wrong here. It's not like, you know, nuclear weapons have been um, disbanded. I mean, there's more countries out there that have them. And there is still right that likely, you know, or at least that possible scenario where, you know, a nuclear country could decide, you know what? Let's just have some fun, launch a couple of missiles at another country, and, you know, the human population goes extinct. The thing is, it's not as felt as much now as it was overwhelmingly perceived in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember up until the first or second grade, you know, we had, in addition to fire drills, which were always fun because we got to go outside— the ones that I hated were the bomb drills, which, you know, you'd get that, um, you know, apocalyptic sounding siren that would go off. And we all had to duck under our desks, you know, the whole duck and cover thing. And even as a kid, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if, it, if a nuclear bomb is going to hit my school, I don't think this desk is going to save me. You know, maybe the lead paint would cancel out the radiation. But other than that, um, we, you know, we're all goners. There's no fallout shelter <laughs> that we have. I, let me get serious here for a minute here. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the United Nations was actively involved in getting the two most preeminent possessors of nuclear weapons, the United States and the Soviet Union, to agree to a number of treaties on arms control as well as disarmament. Um, one of the big things was that, no, not every country can have nuclear weapons, right? Germany, you can't have nuclear weapons. We can only imagine what you would do with them. Um, you know, France, the UK, China, okay, I mean, there's nothing that we can really do about that. But not everybody can possess nuclear weapons, not everybody can possess nuclear power. And while we're at it, those that have nuclear power um, and nuclear capabilities need to limit the stockpile of their weapons just for the sake of some, you know, global peace. The UN has been at the forefront of that. So more than just simply a tool for Cold War power politics, the UN has been able to kind of rise above this, you know, bipolar, um, you know, tug of war and start initiating policy that is more openly and collectively agreed upon by all participating members. The big change, right, the big, big, big change happens in the late 50s and throughout much of the 60s when most of the world's colonies are granted sovereignty. So whatever remaining colonies of the British, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and even Belgium and Dutch colonial systems existed, they have all now been granted, you know, sovereign independence and, as such, are given their own special seat at the United Nations. What we see here is not just a doubling of the UN's delegation um, amount, but an influx of developing countries, what we would call the global south, that now as a collective whole, we'll just, you know, we call them, you know, the group of 77, are able to form this type of um, unofficial coalition that engage in voting blocks, if not at the Security Council, definitely at the General Assembly, 
um, as a way of countering, right, the voting perceptions and interests of older, more established UN members of the global north. Um, the UN was at the forefront in promoting principles of self-determination, which is what led to many of these colonies to become independent states of their own. Now, self-determination is not anything new uh, to the UN, right? It was a big thing that characterized um, the previously existing organization, the League of Nations. Um, many of the countries that were pushing for self-determination at the end of the First World War for, you know, Austria and Germany and uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, conveniently forgot that they had colonies of their own. Somebody decided to tell them a couple of decades later, hey, 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 self-determination, you know, that stuff's still important. Um, you might want to give up uh, much of your real estate in, uh, you know, in Africa. And so the, you know, emergence in the General Assembly of dozens of new countries in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, um, you know, created a new voting bloc that collectively, as I've been saying, uh, provided some kind of, you know, united front in um, advancing and um, supporting new economic policies of development, of investment, of industrialization, um, and also sort of stymieing um, the comparative advantage that many previously existing industrialized countries of Europe, North America, and others had. Um, the third great major evolutionary change was what happened when the Cold War had ended, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and what really is important here is that you know, if the Cold War kind of ends somewhere between 1990 and 1991, um, a few years later, in fact, I like to mention, I like to say 1995, the age of globalization begins, right? And this is where the internet becomes a household thing. Um, people are able to communicate faster and cheaper and more reliable than beforehand. You know, today we kind of take uh, these uh, technological facets of globalization for granted. Um, you know, the fact that I'm able to um, teach and provide all of my lectures asynchronously online not only implies that I have the technology to do so, but you have the internet to access it. Um, the fact that um, all of our readings are on Blackboard, as opposed to me forcing you to buy dozens and dozens of books or make this unruly um, Xerox packet uh, for you to carry and break your spine <laughs> you know, walking to class, sort of implies, right, implies that there is um, a major technological, you know, evolution that the United Nations has, you know, kind of needing to get its hands around, right, especially when globalization has been exacerbating the socioeconomic and the sociopolitical differences between the global north and the global south. So in order to sort of meet the needs and also to avoid the global south being exploited, the United Nations has taken it upon itself to promote a number of sustainable developmental goals, um, continue with conflict resolution, but in this case also move conflict resolution towards some degree of democratization. You also got to remember, in the wake of the Cold War, there is only one remaining political ideology that is still considered to be globally acceptable, and that's democracy. Right? And while this might be a bit um, abstract to think about, right, the Cold War's end <clears throat> and the Soviet Union's collapse effectively meant that communism as an alternative form of government to democracy, or even more so capitalism, had been discredited. So the 1990s gives us this uh, proverbial end of history in which all roads will eventually lead towards some form of democracy and market capitalism. Although I can say that, you know, 30 plus years later, you know, democracy has kind of taken a bit of a back burner and you know, everybody's just doing, you know, capitalism. But that's why the United Nations feels that it is um, responsible for promoting um, some type of democratization uh, within conflict resolution, uh, simply because democracies don't go to war with each other, but also because democracies tend to promote by themselves a significant degree of political rights and civil liberties, two of which are key towards the creation and fostering of a global civil society.
So, yeah, I mean, the U.N. has got some, you know, neat things that it has accomplished or has put its name behind or has sponsored or has, you know, been on the right side of history and supported. Um, you know, in this sense, we're trying to get us, you know, we're trying to figure out, all right, so how does the U.N. therefore work within the larger confines of IR theory? And, you know, those of you who have had me before in international organization, intro to IR, or you've just perused my YouTube videos and get a sense of, you know, my hot takes on realism, Marxism, liberalism, constructivism, and institutionalism. Uh, and I'm not going to go through every one of them now. I mean, if you want to, you know, I've got videos that talk about this. The UN is at least philosophically rooted within the school of liberalism. Okay? Within the school of liberalism. I mean, it is an institution, and institutionalism can very much be a subset of liberalism, but, you know, institutionalism does have its realist, its constructivist, and yes, even its Marxist undertones. But I want to talk specifically about the liberalist philosophy because there's sort of an ethos that goes into it, right? And the understanding of liberalism from a philosophical standpoint is that human nature, human behavior, and social progress are all positive attributes, right? And this is, is sort of in direct um, opposition to the prevailing understandings of realism, which will have you to believe that, you know, humans are selfish, self-preservatory, and will, you know, rely on self-preservation uh, before they cooperate with anybody else. Liberalism is like, no, 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 hang on a second, hang on a second. The only reason why people are like that is because of uncertainty, um, and because of um, the lack of security. Once we have that, right, we find that people will cooperate. And they'll cooperate rather openly and happily, right? And so in this sense, human rights and social justice, which can oftentimes be overshadowed and abused by, you know, aggressive powers or by the, you know, the pervasive nature of war, well, they need to be safeguarded, and they have to be somehow upheld through institutions like the UN or the European Union or the League of Nations in this sense. But we're going to focus on the UN, obviously, for this class. And so it's the UN's imperative to make the promotion of human rights and the expansion of social justice part of its mantra, right? Part of its operating system. Now, alongside that, right? The philosophy of liberalism also understands collective security to come through economic cooperation and international law. So when we talk about economic cooperation, right, there is this understanding of what I will call, um, what was it, uh, the, the, the um, economic peace theory, right, or economic interdependency. And that is two countries that are linked. Their economies are linked through, you know, trans-border trade. Um, one relies on the other's raw materials, some kind of economic agreement. These two countries are not going to go to war with each other for one very simple reason. You're not going to go to war with a country that you're trading with because it's bad for business. And the idea is, is that you run the risk of destroying the infrastructure of that country that provides you with goods and services. So while there might be animosity, between countries like India and Pakistan, or China and the territory of Taiwan. The likelihood of war is little to non-existent, not because one country is overwhelmingly more powerful than the other. Although if you really think about it, if China really wanted to, they could probably invade and occupy Taiwan in about 24 hours. But more to the point is that the economies are, are linked together to a point where you don't need to invade. You don't need to, um, you know, take that animosity beyond the rhetorical level, right? So the fact that war and conflict are somehow mitigated because of economic interdependence is enough for the practitioners of liberalism to say, hey, this stuff works, right? We've avoided the conflict. We've we have avoided. We have eliminated the possibility of war between Germany and France for the foreseeable future. We have done the same between India and Pakistan. Of course, the two countries having nuclear weapons well, you know, sort of helps as well, you know, right? Um, and as I like to, you know, joke, you know, if the United States ever went to war with Canada, I don't know why we would, but, you know, would we win the war? Most likely, but why would we do that? 
right? Why would we, right? Canada is one of our biggest trading partners. If you invade Canada, um, you again, you run the risk of destroying infrastructure. So market capitalism is certainly a way that promotes this idea of interdependency and collective security. Then we have the idea of democratic peace theory, which, as I've already mentioned, is the understanding that no two democracies go to war with each other. It's just it just doesn't happen. Um, authoritarian states go to war with other authoritarian states and you better believe that democracies go to war with authoritarian states but two democracies they don't so you know you kind of take this idea and you think to yourself all right well you know the more democracies that exist in the world um that automatically uh, reduces the likelihood of warfare it doesn't mean that you're going to be buddy buddy but it's going to mean that all of your problems and grievances are going to be meted out at the negotiating table not on the battlefield so liberalism, um, you know, I don't want to say discounts the philosophies of realism, because if it did, we wouldn't be talking about realism. But liberalism does a very good job of pointing out the weaknesses and the shortcomings of many aspects of realism. Now, mind you, the liberalist philosophy is predicated on a number of assumptions and beliefs in human progress being positive. So if you go with that, then the rest of the stuff seems to fall into place. It also seems to assume, right, that states are going to put economic trade as the primary thing between the two, and not the plight of minorities, not border disputes, um, not irredentism. No, these things happen. These things definitely do happen. Um, but oftentimes, if economic trade overpowers these smaller nationalistic things and these grievances are for the most part relegated to the internet comment section well then fine no who cares so in this sense liberalism understands humans to be by nature good right they are only led astray by fear and uncertainty so that's where institutions come in right the role of the um is to really do what well, the primary thing is to reduce the amount of uncertainty by providing itself as an, you know, an intermediary for discussion, for negotiation, for compromise, for sharing of ideas. So just by that alone, uncertainty is reduced. Now, how do we get rid of the fear part? Awesome. The UN doesn't just sit there as this neutral area, but it's an organization that provides or at the absolute least promotes a sense of, of social justice, right? Transnational social justice, right? The UN doesn't care about one country over another. It cares about the whole landmass, right? That's the whole idea. The UN will, at least the bureaucratic level of the UN, the conference level of the UN, looks at a map without national borders. They'll look at the natural resources, they'll look at the demographics that oftentimes span two or three boundaries, and they'll say, hey, this stuff needs to be attended to. Now, what are the boundaries that intersect these areas? That country, that country, and that country? Cool. Call, call all three countries together, and let's get them working on this thing. This sense of transnationalism leads to greater guarantees of peace and smaller degrees of uncertainty. You throw in commercial pacifism, you throw in democratic peace theory, and suddenly people are wondering, why in the world did we go to war all those years ago? Shit, we should have been doing this a hell of a lot earlier, right? So by creating this degree of interconnected communication, the threat of war and the threats to security are significantly reduced. In addition, theories of liberalism defend and protect the concept of human rights. And therefore, right, states have... Well, a primary obligation of states is to uphold principles of human rights and civil liberties for their own citizens. And, you know, with an organization like the United Nations, it is in a state's good interest, a strategic interest, right, to promote these things. Because it makes the state look good on the international front, right? That's the reason why every time we have these lists of, you know, the best countries to live in, the best uh, qualities of life, uh, the best social welfare services. You know, we get these squeaky clean countries in Scandinavia, like Norway and Sweden and Iceland and Finland. And then as we get a little bit south in Europe, we look at Austria or Switzerland, um, Portugal, 
Uruguay, if you want to, you know, go outside of Europe, Bhutan, if you want to look at uh, Central Asia. I mean, this is a country that um, effectively, as I, you know, as I mentioned, um, makes environmental protection a paramount issue and a human right. Right? So it is a human right as a citizen of Bhutan to have access to clean water, clean air, and pristine forests and parks. Right? <clears throat> Great place to go, right? So in this sense, the UN um, should promote the idea that states will support human rights and civil liberties. Now, what about war? What about conflict in this sense? Now, here's where things get a little interesting, right? Because if this is a defining ideology for a state's foreign policy, it's not enough to just simply say, we support human rights and civil liberties in our own country. But we have to also safeguard those two things in other countries. And if we see human rights and civil liberties being violated, like openly violated, right? Like the you know Rohingyas of Myanmar, or the Yazidis of Iraq, or the Kurds of Turkey, um, you know, or you know, you, you, or, or the Uyghurs of China, then liberalism makes the case for some kind of intervention, some kind of intervention, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the military, but intervention can be, you know, economic embargo, diplomatic pressure, um, diplomatic isolation, right? The state could be pulled from a number of UN committees and think tanks. Um, and yes, if it's, you know, absolutely horrible, like genocide is, you know, taking place, then yes, the UN can, if it, you know, gets all the votes, um, pass a resolution calling for uh, military intervention. But all of this is done in the name of legal and moral principles, right? So it is the goal of liberalism to defend human rights wherever they happen to be violated. Now, you can think to yourself, all right, well, that just makes liberalism the most belligerent IR theory out there. And you're not entirely wrong, right? There's a reason why the United States loves to play the liberalism card when it wants to intervene in another country, right? We don't, we, we don't do what Russia does. Or it's like, you know, well, they've got, you know, things that we want, you know, I'm just going to go and take it, you know? No, no, no. In the United States, it's, we come up with some reason, you know, uh, the plight of this one minority, um, ethnic concentration camps are happening here, uh, violation of human rights are happening over there, and that justifies uh, intervention. Okay? So liberalism kind of functions as the core of international organizations like the UN, in which the UN will give the idea that, this, that member states, well, at least those that are you know, powerful enough to do so, have incentives to cooperate both for self-interest as well as for the common good, right? And cooperation um, that continues, right? Con you know, cooperation that continues into the future will lead to increased amounts of bargaining, compromise, and moderation. So increased cooperation means increased interdependency. Increased interdependency continues on further increased cooperation. And that's the reason why states also have some obligation to monitor and critique neighboring countries that aren't cooperating, right? So that's why we will oftentimes frame foreign policy within some type of moral understanding. So it's not like, you know, Syria is bad because of um, the, the philosophical tenets of the Ba'ath Party. No, no one really cares about that. Syria is bad because people are dying. Syria is bad because, oh, look at the pictures of, you know, shell-shocked women and children, or the um, amount of refugees that are fleeing the country into Europe. Somebody has to do something about that. Or the starving children of Somalia or Sudan, or, you know, the, um, the destruction of villages in Myanmar, uh, by the, uh, you know, by the uh, state army in this sense. So, you know, in this regard here, the United Nations has taken it upon itself to have some kind of moral imperative in the absolute least making the world, you know, a better place uh, for... But while moral imperatives are all fine and good, right, reality will often hit when we realize what the UN is actually capable 
of doing, right? So it's not enough to just simply say, hey, things should happen in a certain way. Um, you know, would have, could have, should have. Um, does the UN have the um, ability to make that change? And here's where things get, unfortunately, a little bit more soberingly realistic. So the UN can carry the moral message of global engagement and development, right? But as I've already mentioned, it lacks much of the practical capacity to do so. And this is not because the UN is dysfunctional or incapable. It's that the UN was never set up to do that, right? This, we, we tend to forget that international organizations are designed exactly the way their member states want them to be. So, you know, even in, in a parallel class, if I was to offer on the European Union, right, and I usually say this, is that the European Union is oftentimes expected to be some kind of democratic political body. It is not, and it never was designed to be. The European Union was and will be, if nothing more, an economic regulatory body. It is the role of the individual member states to provide the democratic norms and functions. So this is the same thing with the United Nations, right? The UN does not have the capacity to implement, doesn't have the capacity to execute. It can provide guidelines. It can push for memorandums and proclamations and treaties and other elements like that. But it is up to the states to make or break any of these ideas. And, you know, while we can think to ourselves, all right, fine, let the states do so, it's interesting to note how rigid protocol happens to be within the UN. Whereas states may realize, right, and this is particularly true when it comes to things like climate change or environmental protection or um, alternative sources of energy to fossil fuels, a number of developing countries and even some of the more powerful ones like China and India could say, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Well, the environment needs protecting. Uh, clean water is something that should be for everyone. And, uh, you know, renewable energy is the way to go. But uh, here's the thing. Um, I'm a major manufacturing country right now. And um, all the other countries previously went through their own industrial revolutions to become as rich and as powerful and as um, mobile as they are. Well, it's our turn to do so now, right? You can't all of a sudden throw regulations and obstacles onto us if we're expected to be the world's sweatshop. Um, and in that regard, unfortunately, a number of you know national delegates to the UN may rhetorically believe in the moral message, but are going to be voting directly against it because of their own national interests, as well as whatever instructions that they're, you know, getting from home. Another inconvenient truth to note about the UN, as I've already mentioned, is that the UN is not structured, nor will it be structured, to be a global authority that surpasses the sovereign authority of states. So where does the UN's capability lie? Mostly, as I've said, in addressing and engaging transnational problems and challenges. Um, and this requires cooperation and commitment of states, especially when the burden and necessity of cooperation is happening through sublevel organizations and third-party NGOs. And what do I mean by this? More often than not, the UN doesn't really get directly involved in these moral messages, right? It, it has its big proclamation. Here's the big poster that you're going to see in the lobby for all the students that are visiting that day. But... The UN has dozens and dozens of sub-level organizations, groups, um, subgroups, partnerships with third-party NGOs. These are the ones that actually are the ones that can get things done, but they're the ones that have to work with individual states. Sometimes the diplomacy works, sometimes it doesn't. So in this case, you got to find out where the line of communication can oftentimes be broken. And, you know, this leads us to bring up, uh, just very quickly, uh, the continued need for expanding the concept of international global governance, right? So the UN is something that, you know, kind of always seems to be two weeks behind global trends, if not more. 
Um, but you know, areas like peacekeeping also now need to evolve into peace building. Concepts of international regulation on environmental protection and climate control constantly need to be updated, adapted to new circumstances and new challenges. Um, it might be an impossible feat to alleviate poverty and inequality in the world, but reducing the you know the the, the you know some of the worst levels of it, or increasing uh, the degree of you know literacy or some basic social standards of living in some of the poorest countries in the world are things that the UN needs to focus on and invest in. This goes right hand in hand with the promotion of greater economic and social well-being, as well as providing humanitarian relief for victims of natural disasters and man-made violence, protection of human resource, uh, pr protection of human rights, and a promotion of a sense of global interdependence. Now, the UN's doing all of this, right? The UN is doing all of this, but, you know, is it doing enough? Is it as engaged and invested in some areas of the world as it is? Is this the vocation of the UN? Does this involve third-party NGOs with, you know, instructions and mandates from the UN to act accordingly? Okay. I think that one of the ways in which we can um, identify why things work the way that they are <clears throat> is by relying on uh, Roland Rich's article, um, the UN, you know, 70 years on. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, right, he talks about really three UNs. Um, the first UN is the one that most people know when they think of it, right? It's where the students go on their field trips to, they get, oh, look, here's us in the General Assembly. Oh, look, here's us in the Security Council. Let's get a group picture. Oh my God, Sergei Lavrov just walked in the room. Let's get a selfie with him, right? This is the UN of member states. This is the UN that is the most publicly visible, right? So when we see uh, you know, news videos of delegates speaking and arguing, especially at the Security Council. This is the most public face of the United Nations, an arena of currently 193 independent national interests and agendas at the General Assembly, and 15 of those members, uh, which make up the Security Council, which if you know, five of those 15 are permanent members, and the other 10 are rotating on a two-year term. Okay? So it's within this first UN <clears throat> that we hear about regional block voting, right? the Group of 77 that I mentioned a couple of slides earlier, and you know, the glaring um, you know, sense of diplomatic rivalries and animosity. Now, most of the time, you're going to get this at the, at the Security Council, um, specifically between the United Nations, and, uh, the United States, and, you know, most likely uh, Russia. So, you know, before she resigned um, under Trump, uh, Nikki Haley, who was, you know, tasked with speaking on behalf of, you know, a Trumpian version of the United States, would oftentimes use her, you know, platform and her microphone to advance Trump's foreign policies, which, you know, would be met with some degree of scorn and derision by Russia or France or any other country like that. This is where you kind of see people squabbling because they all have national interests and they come with national mandates, right? They are operating within strict mandates defined by their national governments. And if you remember, I, I mentioned this um, in the first lecture, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people that are doing the communicating believe in this stuff. But if they're given strict instructions from home, they have to carry this stuff out. So they might be forced to support or defend policies you know, against their own personal interests. And you know, Rich, among others, kind of gave personal accounts that, yes, there were times where he was directly representing Australia and was told to you know, promote certain things that he himself personally disagreed with. Um, if you're okay with that, and you're totally fine just being, you know, the career diplomat, um, <clears throat> or better yet, if you agree with your state mandates, but you want to be able to persuade other people to do the same thing, right? This is where you can effectively create a lucrative position for yourself, right? And most states who have their, you know, delegates at the first UM, as I've said, are career diplomats. Um, they represent multiple governments over the years, and it really is sort of a permanent job for them. 
Um, the United States is somewhat different in that, in that we will appoint a new um, you know, ambassador to the UN with every new presidential administration. Um, another big problem that the UN is facing, I think even more so today in the last 20 years than the previous 50, is the idea of sovereignty and challenges to that sovereignty. So, you know, one of the big sticking points of being a UN member is that you have to possess a constitutive sovereignty. Right? So there's 193 member states of the UN. That doesn't mean that that represents every country or territory in the world, right? There are a lot of what we call de facto um, disputed territories, um, what I even will uh, specifically call parastates, um, territorial entities that claim sovereignty, sometimes have some degree of international recognition, but is not recognized officially by the United Nations, right? So in this case, there's Kosovo and Taiwan, Artsakh, Northern Cyprus. I included Palestine in this family. Now, Palestine does have some representation at the UN, but it has observer status, which means that it does not have the ability to vote on anything. They're just there for display purposes only. Um, and this is largely because of the constant vetoes at the Security Council from the United States, which is, you know, doing Israel a favor. Um, in this sense, right, the United Nations defines membership along lines of understanding that are still very much 20th century, right? Um, the number of disputed de facto territories that technically are part of another country, but have no representation by that country, and that country has no influence within this breakaway region, um, they're sort of sitting in limbo. And they have little to no ability at voicing their grievances and interests um, at a UN that does not recognize them as a member. So at the absolute best, they can get in um, on a visitor pass. Or, you know, if another country vouches for them. So, you know, like the delegation from Kosovo gets in because of U.S. sponsorship. Um, the uh, delegation from Abkhazia or South Ossetia comes in uh, from Russian sponsorship, right? Um, you know, beyond the ideas of membership is also, going back to um, a previous discussion of intervention, um, something that is still hotly contested at the U.N., right? Is it legal for one state, or is it even legal for the United Nations to intervene in the affairs of another country if that country is perceived to be problematic, um, falling behind on certain global humanitarian standards, um, or just, you know, simply just being a rogue state in that matter? And, you know, to that, how is intervention currently understood? You know, when we think of intervention, we still think of military intervention. But, you know, what are the, um, what are the legal parameters? And what are the capabilities of economic intervention, technological, humanitarian? Um, these are all things that, you know, might seem, uh, you know, trivial to the outside member by saying, well, you, you know, the UN, if it has the uh, moral imperative to intervene in a country that needs it, well, then it's going to go ahead and do so. But we have to remember, right, the idea of a sovereign state means that intervention should really only come if the state allows it or permits it, right? Or unless the state is, is, is conducting such egregious activities that, you know, the world just feels that there is a moral imperative uh, to intervene. These discussions are really more or less the vocation of what Rich calls the second UN, right? The second UN, the, you know, this is really the role of the UN Secretariat, which oftentimes, you know, we just tend to think, um, you know the um, you know the the the, um, the general secretary of the uh, of the UN is the only thing. No 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 no. There is an entire bureaucratic body that works at the UN that thinks, debates, problematizes, and comes up with solutions at an international level. Right. This is the bureaucratic backbone of the UN. These are individuals that do not work 
for a specific country. They work for the UN. But herein lies a problem. If they are effectively international workers, um, they are attached in some way to some member state, right? There's no like international, you know, citizenship or whatever it is. Do these individuals simply wait for instruction from member states, the first UN, or do they kind of get dynamic and creative amongst one another by, regardless of whatever they're told by the states to do, do they have the freedom, the creativity, and the ingenuity to kind of look at um, you know, state policy through UN-oriented agendas. In other words, um, you know, do they have the freedom and, and the capacity to kind of provide the problem-solving issues that the first UN can't do, right? The first level of the UN is national interests, national directives. The second UN are those people that are kind of given those directives and then said, okay, make something out of that. Um, these individuals have, you know, a greater ability to adhere to and uphold right the principles of the UN Charter. Okay, so you know these people are the ones that are really acting uh, within a true international setting, um, along with people that you know at least as far as the job descriptions are concerned, um, are dedicated and committed individuals to providing a better world. Right. So for those of you that might be interested in working at the UN but working outside the confines of a national state. And you just want to be, you know, here, there, and everywhere working on real problem-solving solutions. This is the area really for you, right? It involves not just ingenuity, but, you know, negotiating abilities with international peers over legal as well as moral issues. Um, finally, right, we have to think about this for a moment, right? When we're talking about working with others around the world in tackling problems and coming up with solutions, right, we need to think about the importance of a diplomatic language and a sort of collective form of communication. Now, this isn't some group project that you come up with in school. And, you know, if any of you have, um, you know, or were part of your high school model UN, uh, you know, groups, you would know that there is a certain degree of protocol and etiquette um, and diplomacy that needs to be sort of in place here. Um, and so this leads us to ask, you know, is there a diplomatic language that is professionally present um, in all languages that are spoken, not just the, you know, the, the six official ones, but is there a way in which, you know, people can communicate with each other? Is there, a, is there, is there importance in wording that makes a resolution a bit more um, impactful? Um, is there specific wording or phrases and meanings that make charters and treaties and, um, you know, goals somehow more understood and practically applied. Um, you, know, we, we, you know, we have to kind of understand that there is, you know, an equal importance, um, not just in negotiation and protocol, but in the word choice that goes into that, right? We're dealing with individuals that might have, you know, everything ranging from, you know, egos to, you know, language problems. And, you know, unfortunately, um, the advantages of English oftentimes overpower, right, and supersede the way in which non-English speaking delegates, bureaucrats, and other members, uh, you know, operate, think, and behave, right? So it's not just words that we're talking about, but it's the meanings of words. And what's interesting about the pervasiveness of English is that it is among other things, really, a, you know, a holdover of institutional and cultural legacies of 20th century great power politics. So, you know, not just the United States, but prior to that, um, you know, Great Britain, the United Kingdom. Um, you know, in a previous century, French was the, you know, diplomatic language. Today, it is increasingly, right, English that is spoken. But, you know, even beyond the official understandings of language, communication, and diplomacy, is I and I what I think is the more important aspect of public diplomacy, right? Public diplomacy, and that is how negotiations are made, how cooperation is achieved, 
how relationships are built um, between uh, delegate members, UN workers, outside of the you know conventional uh, conference room, right? And you know it's widely known within UN circles, right, that some of the best um, negotiators, some of the best communicators, are those that you know host delegates, host people, you know, at their <clears throat> UN ambassador residences, food, wine, vodka. Sergey Lavrov is, you know, certainly known as somebody who will, you know, try to, um, you know, wine and dine someone with charm and personality and hospitality. And of course, you know, if all else fails, bring out the vodka at the end of the night. And trust me, you'll sign you know, any, you'll sign any resolution, you know, anything else out there, right? How does this work, right? These are elements that I think are not just specific to the second UN, right? They're pervasive in all three, but the ways in which things get done, the ways in which cooperation happens um, relies heavily on the notion of language, word choice, and understanding. Another thing that we need to look at, and you know, we're about to wrap up this, uh, the, the, this, this lecture here, is the continued need for leadership, right? The continued need for leadership at the UN, especially in an age of multipolarism and multilateralism, right? And I've mentioned this already before, but it's worth bringing up again. The United States is no longer a global hegemon. It is, to be sure, a major global power. But in 2020, 2021, right, it's becoming clear that the world is defined by three, four, maybe five um, large powers. They might be regional powers, but I think it's fair enough to say, right, that some of the three, you know, three biggest countries in the world today is the U.S., China, and Russia. Now, all three of them have different foreign policy interests. They have different ways of engaging the world. Um, some of them think of intervention in terms of military, others in terms of economics. Um, but what's, what, what's clear, right, is that this is the first time that the United Nations has been around in an age of multipolarism. So in this sense, it is paramount for the UN Secretary General for the UN Secretariat in a larger sense, right, to, you know, emerge as somewhat of a leader, more than just simply a figurehead. Um, and the idea that secretary generals have a lot of soft power, and they have a lot of public legitimacy, helps explain that, you know, the last number of uh, secretary generals, I mean, the first one is, uh, most current is Antonio Guterres, Prior to him, Ban Ki-moon, before him, Kofi Annan, before him, Boutros Boutros Ghali. I mean, you know, they have personalities, they have um, charisma, uh, they have some kind of global following. And, you know, if nothing else, they're seen as, let's say, alternatives to, you know, U.S. or Russian or Chinese uh, foreign influence, then the U.N.'s leadership um, is certainly something that needs to be enhanced and, you know, expanded. One way in which the UN's leadership can work is through the third UN, and that is the civil society actors, the non-governmental organizations and individuals who interact with the UN. They don't necessarily um, are part of the UN, right? I mean, certainly um, those that uh, work directly with the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, uh, it's more of an official relationship. But the UN partners with a whole bunch of NGOs, grassroots movements, um, activist groups that, you know, run the gamut from like Red Cross to something incredibly regional and specific to, um, you know, Western Africa. Um, what this third UN does is it's probably the most directly impacting on areas of investment, development, and engagement. Um, <clears throat> what's also interesting about this is that this third UN is probably the biggest and most you know, definitive safeguard um, in preventing lopsided influence from member states, right? So it's a way for, let's say, the second UN to maintain an international outlook, right? That second UN is kind of caught between the member states and the NGOs. Um, if they're waiting for some kind of directive from member states, they can work and partner with NGOs, the civil society sector, academics, you know, individuals with 
money, influence, whatever it happens to be, and, you know, get their hands wet. And it's this third UM, right, that uh, is largely responsible for the creation of, you know, councils and commissions on human rights, um, conferences on climate change and the environment, um, you know, think tanks and research groups on human development. So there's like, you know, there's an academic element uh, to the UN as well. So if you're thinking, hey, I'd like to work at the UN, but maybe not work as a, you know, bureaucrat, um, but maybe think, but work as an intellectual, as a researcher, um, this leads to the expanding idea of a UN project, right? So the United Nations, it, it's more than just simply um, an organization of, you know, ambassadors that, you know, meet once a year in New York to give a couple of speeches that are lofty with platitudes and others and everybody goes home, right? The UN is operating, right, 24-7 uh, around the world in multiple locations, right? And, you know, I think that that's, you know, a good place to stop right now. I mean, it's, it, this, this really just finishes out our introduction to the United Nations, but now gives us the capacity to understand where the UN comes from, what are some of the historical um, developments that led to its creation, and this is what we're going to start looking at next week when we examine the historical dimensions of institutionalism up to and including the League of Nations, and then finally the creation of the United Nations in the mid-1940s um, that is built on the successes as well as the mistakes of previous organizations. Right? So stay tuned because we are just getting started, and I hope that you find this stuff to be as interesting as I do.